All right, guys. Uh, glad to have everybody here, and uh, I would uh, try my I'll try my best to make sure that uh, this particular session of one hour, approximately, is worthwhile for you. Um, as you must have observed in the last uh, couple of sessions, that uh, the focus of Sorry, I was able to somehow hear myself. Okay, so as you would have observed in the last two sessions, the focus has been specifically on finance, right? And what is the, and today's objective is to make you understand that what are the career options uh, for finance aspirants, you know, people who want to specifically make a career uh, in financial data science, right? So there is actually a role called as financial data scientist as well, which is an umbrella role. It has a lot of uh, sub roles uh, behind it. And we will have, a, uh, you know, a few discussions around that. Um, please feel free to stop me wherever you have a question. I'll take the question. If I see that I'm going to cover that question anyhow in my uh, session, then I will park lot it but I will try and cover all the questions that come along. Uh, so let me first tell you a story, a small story, right? Um, let's say, uh, what does a consultant do to propose his girlfriend? And this is a story uh, that uh, involves me as well. So when I was proposing my girlfriend, I and I'm talking about uh, 20 years, I mean, not 20 years ago, but uh, approximately 15, 16 years ago, uh, uh, when I was proposing my girlfriend, now who's, who's my wife, what is the algorithm that I use, right? And, you know, I what I want to show with this example is that data science is application in all various domains. Uh, it touches everybody's lives. Uh, there is no industry in the world which is not touched. There is no person in the world who's digitally connected is not touched by, uh, touched by data science. So let's look at uh, the algorithm that I, or the process that I followed, right? And maybe you can also follow the same. Um, so before proposing, of course, you know, I wanted to get the yes, right? And uh, the girlfriend that I was proposing, I had some uh, data around her because, you know, she was also one of my best friends. So uh, I wanted to understand that, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that, you know, she gives me a yes when I propose. So the uh, first thing I did is, uh, you know, uh, pros and cons analysis, which is really, you know, advantage or disadvantage analysis. And then I, ga I gave each uh, pro and con a weight. You know, a weight is like a importance of priority, right? So that became a weighted pros and cons analysis. And then uh, I did a SWOT analysis. So I was not satisfied with pros and cons because it did not give me a conclusion result. Then I did uh, something called as a SWOT analysis, which is strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, right? Which is something kind of uh, sim same thing that you would have seen, uh, you know, when let's say Indian cricket team, when they uh, takes a new player. So in the newspapers and news articles, you see, uh, strength and weakness and opportunity threats analysis done for that particular player, right? So I just kind of did uh, that on my life with that girl. And then I used a very simple regression, you know, which basically means that what are the factors? Let's say X, Y, Z. So these are the three factors on the basis of which the result or the outcome will depend, you know, which is to get the yes, right? Uh, uh, and how do I know these? How did I know these factors? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, in the world, uh, uh, I was not the only person who had proposed to a girl. There were a lot of people who had proposed to a girl. So I did some data analysis of, uh, uh, you know, what kind of people actually usually get yes and what are the factors that influence uh, girls' decision to be yes. And I included the specific factors of, uh, of my uh, girlfriend as well into it. And then uh, accordingly, I built a model. A model is really nothing but an equation which uh, gave some... Uh, parameter value to these each one of these variables and that gave me uh, the likelihood of getting a yes uh, from my girlfriend okay i mean um i did get a yes because now we've been married for almost uh, 13 plus years now uh, so well good point that regression does not give a likelihood but logistic regression does right a very good catch there so I didn't want to get into too much of details of that, but yes, the logistic regression would give you a likelihood, which is a classification model, right, uh, uh, of uh, uh, getting a uh, yes or a no uh, uh, wearable yes, right? Good, good point. Good uh, catch there, Arkpavo. But anyway, 
today also we will have little bit of discussion on what is the difference between a classification algorithm uh, 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 like logistic regression uh, and uh, you know supervised algorithms uh, where you label the data like regression and so forth but we'll get into uh, that detail uh, later but i wanted to tell you that that even when you're deciding which cloth to wear you decide on the basis of some data points right you open the wardrobe you open your almira and you are deciding you know which clothes to wear so you decide on the basis of what the weather is who who all you are meeting are you going to work from home are you going to go to the office are you going to the college uh, you know uh, what is the weather outside uh, how are you feeling i mean importance and what are the kind of dresses that you have now imagine if there is a smart wardrobe right which already knows that what are the clothes that you have inside the wardrobe right and what day because it's connected to your gmail calendar uh, right uh, and what day of the week it is uh, what is the weather outside and since it's connected with your gmail calendar so it knows who all you are meeting today looking at the appointment let's say you meant or maintained all the appointment there uh, so and then it also knows what you wore in the past right maybe what you wore in the past with the same person who you are meeting right uh, and according to this all these factors would then help up, uh, help a help that smart wardrobe algorithm to recommend you what clothes uh, that you should wear right it's not a big deal you know there are now a lot of companies which have already started working on these uh, smart wardrobes where you can easily put your uh, clothes which would have you know very thin rfid chips right and uh, they would know the um, the smart wardrobes would know what are the clothes which are inside what are the clothes outside and connected to the internet uh, uh, through a wifi chip your home wifi and it's connected to your gmail uh, i mean your google uh, services including calendar and what not and there you go right you know it, it's not really a rocket science to have something like this right rfid tax yes gaurav sharma uh, rfid is radio frequency identification tax you know those small chips that when you go to buy anything from a retail store you know you would see that there is a small almost like a printed circuit chip which is normally embedded into your uh, new uh, piece of uh, shirt or a trouser or any clothes that you're trying to buy right and they have it uh, because of the security reason and those you know those uh, towers small towers right at the entrance or exit you they normally start beeping you know if you're not paid and if you're giving out and so on so so it's not a really big deal these are very cheap things uh, cheap tax and very easily procurable so if you notice here that data science touches everybody's life touches everything that happens around us right so then why not the banking and financial industry why not the finance industry uh, you see if i were to tell you that finance industry was one of the first and foremost industry to start using data science in a very structured fashion and do you know the reason behind it why do you think the finance industry was the first and the foremost user even till today uh, most of the job openings come uh, typically because of the financial industry in the data science roles any reason any any idea why why is that happening why is it that the finance industry is the uh, foremost industry in the world to hire people in the world of data science and why were the first ones also any idea anybody uh gaurav is saying because maximum data are covered i mean okay what do you mean the maximum data anybody else wants to take a chance uh, take a stab at it okay uh, think think about this right uh, when i mean i don't know if you guys have learned accounting ever in your life but i'm sure people know that when you go to a bank right uh, what do you normally do you either deposit money or you withdraw money right but whatever transaction that happens gets recorded in a very structured fashion right that's the beauty of any financial transaction right uh, you can easily imagine that uh, you know uh, they and when you when you download your statement balance or statement account uh, you easily see that uh, you know there is a description of the item there is credit uh, uh, line and there is a debit line and then there is a balance line right and this kind of a format has been there since the beginning since the conception of the banks or financial institutions right they've been managing their data in a very structured standardized fashion and they've been managing the data that's the main beauty of it they have been managing data so you have all these st- accounting standards and statutory body around the world uh, all different companies countries also have and then there are international laws are 
around managing and uh, maintaining uh, the books of accounts for any company or of, of, of any individual as well, right? So that means the data has been, uh, these financial institutions have been managing their data in a very structured fashion. And so that's one reason that since the financial institutions have huge amount of structured data available to them. So that's one of the main reasons. The second main reason why uh, the financial institutions, the financial industry were the first one and are, and are still the foremost industry to hire uh, people in the data science world is because of the quality of data that they have. So one is, as I said, right, the first reason is structured data, that they have huge amount of structured data. And the second is high quality of data. Now, what do I mean by high quality? Anybody? who can make me understand what is the meaning of high quality of data. Structured data, I'm sure everybody has understood that they store the data in a predefined structure. So there is likelihood of uh, missing out the data is less. What is the meaning of high quality data and why do the financial institutions have higher qual highest quality of data available to them? Any idea? Any idea, anybody? So I'll tell you the reason, right? Let's say, can you imagine going to your bank, let's say Citibank, Standard Chartered, uh, ICSA Bank, any of the banks that you go to, so let's say to open your bank account. Let's say you decide that, you know, I, uh, you don't want to give your phone number or your valid email ID to the bank. Can you even think of doing that, right? The bank would say, no, we are going to KYC. We are going to know your customer validation. That means we are going to verify all the data that you give to us, right? And of course, you know, I mean, you do not want to uh, fudge the data. You do not want to, uh, you know, uh, misinform the bank that, you know, your phone number, your address, your, you know, your gender or your income is something which is not the right thing, which is not true, right? Imagine going to a retailer, like for my example, my dad, right? I mean, when uh, Pantaloons and all were, uh, uh, and uh, sorry, when Flipkart and all these uh, online e-commerce companies started, he, whenever he opened any account in these uh, online e-commerce companies, he would the first thing he would uh, uh, call me up for is that, why are they asking for my phone number? Why do they need my house address? Why? So I said, you know, if they don't have the house address, how will they deliver, right? And if they don't have your phone number, then how will they send the verification OTPs to your phone number and your valid email ID? His point was that then how when I go to pantaloons, they don't ask me for my phone number. And if they, even if they do, I don't, uh, I choose not to give to them and they still allow me to buy products. So there is a huge difference between, uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, giving data to a retailer versus giving data to a bank, right? With a retailer, especially brick and mortar, you know, like physical store retailer, even if you don't give any uh, valid data, they're, they're not going to be surprised with it. Nobody's going to be surprised with it. But you can't do the same with the bank. So the banks or the financial institutions have always had highest quality or truth about their customer uh, right from the beginning, right? Since they have high volume of structured data and that too of higher, highest quality. So when they use their data to make any decisions, right? The quality of that decision or the result of that decision would also be of higher, highest quality. Do you understand? So these are the two main reasons why data science has been prevalent in the BFSI industry, in the finance industry, since uh, for a very, very long time. Is it making sense? Even today, uh, almost one third of all job openings come from within the data science industry or related to the data science industry. Is it making sense, everybody? Yeah? All right. All right. Now, this is just a quick thing about us. You know, we've been working with a lot of financial companies. You can see the list of the companies here. You will see that there are a lot of uh, financial companies as well that we work with. Of course, we work with large companies, uh, Fortune 50 and all. But Honeywell, we, uh, you know, train more than 400 people, 400 financial performance and analytics uh, profession from within Honeywell. Uh, ICRA is one of our client. Nombira Research and, uh, Institute is our client. So you'll see uh, HSBC is our client. A lot of our students are also working in HSBC. So you'll see that, uh, you know, there is a huge number of uh, companies. And this is not just, just a sample list. And, you know, you would see that any such consulting company which is working in the world of data science, they would have good number of uh, financial institutions as their clients. Just because, again, as I said, that they have highest quality of data and very uh, nicely formatted data as well.
right? Um, now, today's agenda, quickly, yeah? You've understood why there is a strong demand. I'm going to go a little further into this. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the strong demand uh, aspect. We will also spend good amount of time in what is the data science applications? What are the different application data science in the uh, financial world? Um, we will also talk about salary, but I always say that in the world of data science, uh, at least as it stands now and how it looks for the next uh, almost a decade, one should not be worried about money, okay? Worry about learning, the money will follow, especially in the world of financial data science, okay? It's the, you, I'm sure everybody understands that uh, there's a lot of money to be made in finance, right? I mean, uh, so money is never a problem, especially in the world of financial data science. So don't worry about money per se, but if you still have any questions about salary, I'll be more than happy to take it. Now, I'll actually focus on this as well today, which is what are the strategies to get into uh, a financial data role, right? If you really want to get into financial data, what, what are the steps to follow? Okay, so we'll talk about that. And in, in that process, if you have any other question, I'll be more than happy to take. Now, let's look at the first one. Why is there a strong demand for financial data science? Although we have already seen two reasons, two core reasons, right? But now let's go a little more specific into it. You see, financial industry expects highest ROI in any kind of investment that they make, specifically in the world of big data, right? Uh, which kind of is the origination factor for uh, data science, right? So since they need highest ROI, right? So that is why they want to hire people who understand data science, right? Ideal world would be that they would want a person who understands finance very well and also understand data science very well, but it's extremely difficult and it's extremely expensive to hire or to find a candidate who understands finance as well as data science very, very well. So that is why what they do is that most of the financial companies, what they do is that they hire people who have core data science skills, maybe through some data science certification courses, uh, boot camps, or some degrees, uh, which are from, which which give them, give, give candidates uh, understanding of how data science skills work, right? And they should have worked and solved problems uh, which, which must have required them to work on data science, complete complete stack of it, right? Not just building the model, but also to be able to deploy the model in some kind of a web application or mobile application, right? If you have that kind of understanding, great, right? So that is why there is a strong demand for people who have learned data science in the world of data, in the world of finance, even if you do not know much about finance, right? Although I do know, I do recommend people that knowing a little bit of finance is not a difficult thing. Right. Um, so a couple of questions that I'm seeing here. One of the question is, uh, uh, Shreya has asked, uh, uh, doing MBA and she's also pursuing data science course. Um, very good. I mean, why not? I mean, MBA uh, uh, allows you to specialize in a lot of things. If you have an interest in marketing analytics, financial analytics, HR analytics, logistics, supply chain analytics, just choose your expertise, choose your interest area there. Data science can be applied there, okay, in all these industries. Um, how does blockchain impact data science uh, or in finance? So, all right, I mean, although this is not a blockchain focused uh, uh, session, uh, towards the end, Siddharth, if I have, some, I have some time, I will definitely talk about blockchain and maybe if you're interested in cryptocurrency a little bit as well. Um, although I wouldn't really claim myself to be a blockchain expert. However, since I'm in this digital data science industry, so, uh, you know, a lot of things are happening in the world of uh, blockchain. So I can talk about it, at least uh, answer some of the questions that you have. So I'll definitely try and answer that question. So that was the end, if we have some time. One of the very important thing, the third things, right, uh, that I want to actually talk about is this, sorry, uh, which is what is the, what are the main objectives of, of any financial data scientist, right? So the financial data scientist's ob main objective is to reduce cost, very important, and increase demand or increase revenue and hence in maximize profits. In our experience of working with large, Fortune 50 uh, organizations where we have trans where we have transformed their entire finance uh, teams or financial performance and analysis team completely from being a, a traditional finance uh, focused person to becoming a financial data science focused uh, uh, professional. We have realized that there are two ultimate goals that any financial institutions have when they are using data science, which is to increase the revenue or increase their demand and to reduce the cost. Please remember, these are the two main value additions 
that your resume when you create your resume resume to apply in a financial data science role or a financial data science role uh, then you that those value additions from your project should be definitely highlighted highlighted that your project or your case study that you worked upon what kind of money it was able to save for you please do ensure that that value is highlighted financial recruiters uh, like to see that and one of the beauty of working on any financial data science project is that it can be quickly highlighted as well whether it is about reducing the cost or whether it is about increasing the demand remember these two very important value addition uh, i just want to talk about uh, some uh, research report as well ernst and young very famous big four uh, consulting and advisory uh, firm they predicted last year that 57% of future financial analyst will be using predictive and prescriptive analytics okay in the last couple of sessions especially uh, in yesterday's session you must have learned some of the uh concepts like machine learning concepts uh, you know how they are used and you must have done one uh, case study as well uh, with faruk and so that's part of predictive and prescriptive uh, analytics okay so almost 60% of the people financial analyst folks would actually require uh, the data science understanding because they work with data right and if i look at my own experience with iv or iv's experience working with these large organizations the last especially last 5 uh, 6 uh, years we have seen a huge demand uh, from various and not just within from within india but from the us from europe as well companies which are working in uh, financial uh, data science roles or uh, uh, projects and they need desperately people who have strong understanding of uh, data science right so this these are the demand drivers for financial data scientists now just to give you some more statistics uh, more uh, some uh, facts and figures here uh, one of the key facts to understand here is that uh, these are all the different data science uh, specific roles or distribution of data science roles that we normally see a, uh, in you know different online portals and so forth so uh, if you notice right risk analytics which is actually one of the subsets of financial data science 18% and uh, financial analytics which is again part plus you know some of the things from here and there consumer insight also is uh, more sorry guys i had to mute you guys some background noise was coming 33% based on overall data analysis i mean overall uh, distribution of the data science jobs 33% of the jobs in the data science industries are from dfsi industry banking financial services services institution or mainly the finance industry okay one third of overall data science jobs okay so remember that it's a lot of op- so opportunities don't worry about opportunities i always say worry about learning okay and you know just that's the main part that you can control and you should focus on uh shreyas again one more question is that uh, can i become what extra skills definitely shreya we will talk about some of the skills specific skills as well today shreya um so now let's go to what are the specific applications of finance in or uh, specific application of data science in finance right what are the specific application so these applications you can divide them into let's say six or seven different categories okay risk analytics or risk analysis we'll talk about each one of them a uh, little briefly fraud detection i'm sure people understand what fraud detection again i'm going to talk about this as well consumer analytics real time analytics algor- algorithmic uh, trading customer data management personalized services, right so let's talk about them what, what is risk analytics does anybody have any question i heard somebody talking uh i am seeing the questions do not worry i'll try and answer all these questions bi reporting is part of descriptive diagnostic which is not part of uh, predictive bi reporting is part of uh, descriptive right where you describe the data uh, that's right uh which is not part of predictive yeah that's right so what is your question sudar anyway let's sudar come with the question let me first explain each one of these with some specific examples and let, let me also give you some indicative list of companies for each one of them uh, each one of these applications risk analytics is you see 
when you go to a bank to apply for let's say credit card or home loan or car loan right bank takes some time to decide whether to give you the home loan and to of uh, you know any kind of uh, credit product right so they take some time they ask you for a lot of data they ask you for civil score they ask you for income data they ask you for a lot of other collateral information asset information income info a lot of things, gender where you live all that information they ask you right based on all that information that they have gathered they decide what is the probability of default or what could be the loss given default or you know meaning if we gave you the loan or let's say you are applying for a home loan of 50 lakhs right you are a young uh, 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 working profession just started working let's say your age is 20 you got recently married your income is let's say uh, you know uh, 12 lakhs and you live in a uh, let's say you live in uh, in a tier 1 city let's say in bangalore and uh, you work in a tier 1 uh, technology firm let's say uh, you know accenture or whatever so now they have gotten the data about you now what they will do is that they will see all their past similar profile of customers who came with similar profile right and their past payment uh, uh, i mean repayment of the loans their patterns right and how much percentage of similar profile of people defaulted on the loan given for let's say an amount close to 50 lakhs on home loan right and if they see that the default rate was less than 1% so they will say you you know what your probability of default is less than 1% normally it could be 5% 10% whatever it is right uh so the idea is that when you say that when you are apply for loan the bank makes this decision on the basis of your past your current data and similar past uh, customers data right and why are they doing so so they are trying to reduce the risk or ex- reduce the exposure of the risk right so that's when the data science come to the picture that's when a lot of statistical algorithms will also come to the picture and nowadays what has started happening is that these credit decisions which which we call them as credit decisions are taken almost in real time let's say you apply let's say there is a american express uh, uh, advertisement on facebook that hey uh, you apply for a credit card with a limit of 50000 and we'll give you the real time approval if you apply now you will get the approval right now so that means their decision their ability to make that credit decision has become faster so you know you upload your uh, uh, your civil score uh, you know you upload your uh, uh, all your demography profile data and everything and their data their algorithm does a real time analysis on your uh, profile and gives a credit decision right away right so that is risk analytics a lot of applications are there i i i spoke about consumer risk analytics whereby a bank is making a decision on individual consumer but think about uh, think about a large financial institution you know a global financial institution uh, for example uh, bank of america or city bank or standard chartered or even hdfc bank any large uh, financial institution they have multiple products they have multiple credit products uh, they give loans not just to individuals but they give loans to entities right and at any point of time they have exposure in the market of the amount of loan they have taken so they have to constantly do risk analytics on their on the exposure of the loans or the credits that they have given to other institutions other entities uh, individuals and so on so forth and keep submitting that report to the central bank for example rbi so that rbi has a very tight control that they want to make sure that nobody fails none of these very large bank as they are called too big to fail right they should not fail overnight i mean imagine what what havoc it will get created if uh if a bank like hdfc or icici or sbi fails overnight and they say that no you can't access your uh, deposited money right like how it happened with yes bank couple of years ago in 2019 right so it becomes very panicky right so the central bank of almost any sovereign country would try to control and understand what is the risk that these banks have taken too big to fail banks have taken in 2008 uh you know lehman brothers failed and that uh, resulted into global financial crisis right so the banks have become the central banks have become smarter they constantly ask for risk analysis report and hence there is a strong applica- strong uh, demand for people who understands risk analysis and it's not very difficult right um uh, you need to know statistical algorithms you need to know 
uh, certain tools as well. And of course, you need to know a little bit about the, you know, how the banking system works. But this is probably the easiest out of all these. Now, easiest, I wouldn't really say easiest or anything, but this is probably one of the places where you have a huge number of job openings. Okay. Fraud detection is any anomaly detection in the pattern. For example, uh, let's say you, you know, as a consumer, if you think about it, uh, you have never used your debit card to buy uh, something in foreign currency. But all of a sudden, you went to some online website and let's say you're playing games or you, you know, buying anything and you paid it in uh, uh, UK pound. So the bank will actually right away or your, you know, your uh, bank's portal would right away reject that transaction, right? Uh, suspecting that this is out of pattern. This is an anomaly in all of your past history of five years using the debit card, right? So it's an anomaly. It's an outlier. So they will say, no, we can't allow this, right? So that is to ensure that there is no fraud detection. A few years ago, not a few years ago, probably 12, 15 months ago, in fact, uh, in my American Express card, uh, in one day at uh, from noon, so 12.30 p.m. or 12 noon, to 5 p.m., right? Uh, I was attending my uh, cousin's wedding. And uh, the, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I saw at 5 p.m. of uh, 6 p.m. when I came back to my hotel, I saw there were 50 pay you transactions. The first transaction. Sorry, guys. Uh, the first transaction was of 500 rupees. And after gradually, uh, every transaction incremented by almost uh, uh, 300, 400. And the last transaction was approximately you know, 4,000 something rupees, but there were 30 such transactions. So before I could call American Express, I had uh, some 10 missed calls from American Express saying that, hey, something is not right with your credit card, right? So that is an anomaly, right? Because American Express knows that I have never used credit card uh, so often uh, and I have not used credit, my American Express credit card to buy anything using PayU and that too so frequently within five to six hours. So they identified that that this pattern is out of the usual pattern and they did fraud detection and, uh, you know, they blocked that credit card, right? So that is that is a classic example of fraud detection, multiple application. Here, um, even if you do not know a lot of statistics, right, a lot of machine learning algorithm, but you have, you understand, you have good reporting understanding, you have good visualization understanding, then also you can get into fraud detection, okay? Uh, but of course, you know, fraud detection becoming more and more advanced because there are frauds are becoming more and more advanced. Uh, consumer analytics, any idea what is consumer analytics, guys? Any idea about consumer analytics, guys? What will consumer buy? Very good question. Very good point, right? What will consumer buy, right? Banks exactly know uh, what you bought, when you bought, what is your age, what is your gender, do you have dependents or not? One of the one of the companies that we worked with, uh, uh, I can't take the name, a few years ago, the idea was that they had uh, they had their all of their more than one crore customers. Uh, behavioral data of last uh, 18 months. They said that, hey, you know what? We know how some how these uh, uh, 10 million plus customers are using their debit card and credit card, whether they're buying insurance, whether they're flying in Jet, uh, jet Airways, Jet Airways is still there, whether they're buying something in Tanish, whether they're buying something at uh, firstcry.com, whether they're buying an LIC policy, if policy, buying LIC policy, then how much of the LIC policy they're buying? What is the premium account, uh, amount? Whether they have any, um, you know, I mean, uh, any uh, past similar uh, healthcare policies or not. So they had all that data and they got all that data from their credit card and debit card transactions, right? And they said that using these transactions, we want to identify out of those 10 million customers data, they wanted to identify, they gave us a first target of identifying 100,000 leads for a new high premium life insurance uh, life insurance uh, policy that they had created life insurance uh, product so they said 
you know what our uh, you know our sales team keep reaching out to different customers but we don't want to do it randomly we already have so much of data available to us then why not yes bajaj fincer uh, uh, or bajaj bajaj financial uh, finance or bajaj financial services fincer is a classic example they use lot of consumer analytics to understand who can be given credit card who can be given what kind of a loan uh, who probably would require loan at what point of the, uh, uh, their life and so forth right so they said that let's identify these 100000 customers from within our customers uh, 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 data uh, using their behavioral analytics right uh, and they said that just give us first 100000 leads and when we started doing analysis we actually found more than 100000 very easily right and it was very easy right anybody who has uh, whose age is let's say more than 7 uh, recently got married buying some jewelry uh, flying uh, through jet uh does not have any other insurance uh, like high insurance policy then uh but you know the income that they are getting in their bank account is pretty all right so it was very easy to kind of come up with such list of customers right so that's consumer uh, analytics and it is becoming sophisticated with the yeah. help of real time yeah. hmm? with the help of, uh, uh unmute yourself if you have any question i don't mind but yeah if you do not have any question please remain on mute so with the help of real time analytics that means real time data analysis right you might have noticed that the moment you buy let's say a tv of uh, 30000 rupees right you automatically get an offer from sdfc saying that hey you just bought a tv using sdfc uh, dynas credit card uh, you know when you buy alexa uh, for 3900 you will get 25% discount if you use credit sdfc credit card so that's real time analytics right real time they are analyzing the data now this becomes a little more sophisticated this also requires lot of this not specifically let's say statistical but it's more about being able to access huge amount of data and use ai i'm sure you know farooq spoke about ai yesterday uh, and deep learning algorithm to kind of categorize the customers who would most likely buy something or not buy something right algorithmic trading algorithmic trading um Do you guys know that most of the trading that happens in the stock market in today's time, the largest volume of tradings are done by softwares, by robots, right? They're not actually done by human beings, but they're done by these algorithms which algorithmic traders have created. Again, easily using and leveraging the time series data or the past data of uh, different uh, uh, external factors of a particular company. fundamentals technicals everything can be built into it to create algorithm which will help us uh, a trader buy or sell an instrument or an asset it could be equity it could be commodity it could be anything right so there are uh, millions of people working in algorithmic trading what they do is they are not like active traders they are not really punching the orders they are not buying and selling by themselves but their algorithms are buying and selling automatically and they do in very high frequency so there is something called as hft you can google high frequency trading this is the biggest thing that is happening in the equity or the, in the in the share market and the stock market right uh, so do do a little bit of research you will find a lot of application of data uh, science there as well customer data management is not so much about data science per se but it, since it's related to the data science industry data industry so hence i put it over here customer data management is that you know if you're just good in reporting if you're just good in managing data if you know sql pretty well if you know big data as well no sql if you know these things which will help manage a, a large financial institution their own internal customer data because remember all these other parts all these other blocks that we are talking of can only make good decisions if the data of the customers is managed properly so that is why customer data management is a huge opportunity area specific, specifically people for people who are little scared of let's say learning machine learning algorithms but they don't mind learning let's say sql or uh, you know a uh, little bit of big data uh, so they are more from technology not so much from the business side or statistical or machine learning side right so there are also you know huge job opportunities are there master data management and so forth personalized services right i mean if you are a premium customer of a bank they want to ensure that before you decide because a premium customer will have lot of options a premium customer will not just bank with one bank they will bank with multiple banks so they want to make sure that you know the services their services that they offer to their premium customers become more and more personalized right before they the premium customers even think of something they can recommend them that hey uh, 
uh, you know, uh, we see that uh, you've not uh, uh, visited, uh, uh, you know, restaurant, your favorite restaurant in the last uh, uh, three months. Can we, uh, can we, uh, do you, uh, can we book that restaurant for you? So a lot of consult based services, personalized services have also started, uh, the banks, uh, the financial institutions have also started proposing to their uh, customers that let us book. So it's called as concierge service, right? American Express is famous for providing a personalized service. And that too is basis the data, right? Instead of pitching all different products that the bank has, they say that, you know what? Why not just pitch golfing resort vacation? Somebody who's... Priyadarshi, you have a question? Okay, no. Right? So that's the next big thing that is happening. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So this, I think more or less everybody has understood, right? What are the different applications of data science, specifically in the world of financial industry, right? Now, specifically, a little, becoming a little more specific here, uh, if I were to categorize the uh, industry into three different categories, right? Financial industry, three different categories. One is banking and financial institutions. So they have financial risk analytics rules. They have compliance analytics rules, uh, uh, AML, and which basically stop the process of any uh, income through illegal actions and so on and so forth. Um, Anti-money laundering, you know, I mean, a lot of international banks have anti-money laundering uh, service as well, or, you know, division, which is again based on a lot of data science, right? They want to understand that, hey, is there a spike in cash transaction in certain banks, right? And they have to report. Now, there are international laws behind it as well to report, you know, FATCA and whatnot, which uh, again requires people who, people who are not, let's say, are sophisticated data science scientists, but they who are who still understand how to work with data. A lot of good roles, not so much of a high salary, but good roles, uh, good number of roles as well here. Uh, marketing analytics, as I said, consumer behavior analytics, right? Algorithmic trading, we have spoken about that also. Financial performance and financial planning and analysis of financial planning and uh, analytics of financial performance analysis, different companies call it differently, but it's called as FPNA. As a short form, you will see lot of financial analyst roles are there, right? For example, I took an example of uh, Honeywell where we did uh, train their uh, 450 plus folks in uh, who were part of FPNA. So there are a lot of these companies who have people working uh, in the in financial analyst role where they create, um, you know, various kind of cost reduction reports and various kind of revenue efficiency uh, reports, right? Uh, supply chain analytics, customer churn analytics, vendor optimization. So basically where the money is spent and where is the money coming? So income. So expenditure and income. So they create, they keep creating reports and then they keep forecasting what could happen in the future, right? So it's again a very, very big area, very big area where you will find a lot of job openings, FPN analytics, okay? Or financial performance and analysis, right? And remember, this is not just that, you know, they are actually working in finance data, per se, as we understand, you know, credit and debit data, but they're actually also looking at how, where the money is, what are the different sources of money and what are the different channels where we are spending money and what is the ROI of those uh, channels? So that, that also comes under financial planning and uh, analysis, right? And actual analysis. Now, this is again, specifically for people who are in risk uh, uh, people who are in uh, people who come with actual background or people who have who have done FRM or have some risk management uh, a background or want to get into that, uh, very sophisticated modeling, right? Especially imagine, you know, how do the companies decide? How do, we, how do these insurance companies decide what should be the insurance amount or premium amount that somebody should need to pay basis the age, basis uh, the amount of insurance that he's taking, the sum of insurance uh, he's taking or he or she is taking. So all that modeling, all that data analysis is done by actual uh, analysts. It's a very sophisticated role, uh, but it's a high paying role. Very, very high paying. One of the toughest job roles probably to get into in the world of financial data science. But if you have a background in natural science or if you have interest, you can definitely explore. Um, so I want to, I know I've got five, seven minutes. I want to talk about one very important thing that what are the things that you need to learn, right? What is the first thing that one should learn? The first thing that one should learn, and you might have realized in the last two sessions, is that you first need to learn the entire data science workflow. Now, what is the meaning of the entire data science workflow? What is the first thing that we do? Uh, and it, it is almost irrespective of which domain that you're applying data science in. 
The first thing that you do is you extract data. Where are you extracting data from? Let's say in a bank, right? You have these databases where the customer, so whenever you transact something, the data gets stored in a database, right? So the data extraction needs to be done by the data folks. And I will tell you, you know, where different roles will come into the picture, okay? Uh, in fact, I do do something for uh, my uh, self here. So I'm just referring to it. So just to ensure that I cover all the points within this as well, right? For example, here, this is where the, so the data will come from something called as some kind of a business process. And the business process could be, let's say, all the transactions done by the customers, right? And then, but the data is not in the right format typically, or it has maybe errors, some errors in it. So you clean the data, you reformat and clean the data. This also requires a lot of people here, right? So this is these two phases. These two phases, first phase is called as preparation phase. You're preparing the data for analysis. You're not doing analysis. There is a lot of job roles available here, there as well. Then you go into something called as experimentation, right? So experimentation is, let's take an example, right? Let's say I want to launch a new credit card into the industry, right? In, into the market. Now I'm trying to understand that who are going to be the customers who will buy, who will be willing to take this new credit card that I'm coming up with. And how many customers do you do I really think will actually be willing to buy? Remember, I gave you an example of 100,000 to find the 100,000 leads for a high premium insurance product earlier. So similarly, the bank, the financial company or institutions may be launching a, a new credit card, right? So they want to now hypothesize, hypothesize meaning that, okay, they will say that, you know what, looking at some past data, I can, we can say with some confidence that, uh, let's say 1 million customers will be willing to buy this new credit card. Uh, uh, from us, willing to take this new credit. But in order to validate this hypothesis, right, they will need to transform the data, which is now cleaned, and visualize. So they will create a lot of reports, you know, who are the kind of customers who have bought similar uh, credit card and what was the pattern and a lot of data, a lot of visualization they will do to kind of figure out that what is going on, what has happened in the past, which is prescriptive, right? prescriptive uh, analytics and then accordingly they will build a model they will say that you know what when we launched a similar credit card one year ago similar maybe a little lower limit maybe a little lower this thing so we were able to, and these were the factors which influence a customer to take and these are the kind of customers who took these were the profile data of those customers who took this credit card from us right so they will build a model a model, as you must have learned yesterday, is just a set of factors which will influence the decision to take the credit card, not to take the credit card, right? Again, you do that on the basis of past data. So this is called as experimentation phase, where you're experimenting a lot with the data, right? Then finally, you create the reports for distribution to decision makers. And you also deploy. So when I say deploy, what does it mean? Deploy means, this is again one of the very, very important things, sorry about that, very, very important thing that modern financial data science guys do. They create reports. Let's say these are all different reports that you've created and you've created a dashboard as well. I'm sure, you know, in the first uh, session you learned with Ishani how to create dashboards. So you created a very nice looking dashboard with a lot of different charts and so forth, right? Now that dashboard needs to be not sent like an Excel form or a PDF form, but it should be available somewhere on an app maybe a mobile app, maybe a web app, right? A desktop app. So that is called as deployment, right? So the data science guys work with uh, some of the software engineers as well very closely to deploy their final reports in a nice looking web app or a uh, mobile app so that the decision makers then use those apps to make the decisions quickly. Or let's say I am a sales manager in a particular region in ICSA bank. I have been given a task to sell a uh, thousand credit cards in one week. So I have a team of 10 sales associate with me who's, who are going to go into the field or maybe going to call the customers. So I need to know that I've got a database of 10,000 customers. Whom should I call first? So this app, this decision making app will quickly reflect that, you know what, your today's task is that you target these customers, it will go into such detail that it will actually also give a list of those customers as well. Or maybe it will give you, you know, some, it will give you some uh, reports saying that identify the customers who are male, whose age is between 30 and 35, 
uh, whose income is more than 10 lakhs who are living in tier one city or you know pin, these pin codes and they would have 90 percent likelihood to say yes to this new credit card that you're trying to launch that you're trying to sell right so this becomes now the sales guys do not have the time and do not have the skill to really go and do their the data analysis they need an app or they need a nicely easily understood uh, dashboard right on their mobile smartphone or on their laptops right so that is called the deployment of the final this thing uh, of the final reports and the algorithm that you have created and this is what you need to learn completely if you want to get into the <coughs> into the um, a pure financial data scientist role. Now, this is complete role end-to-end. -end. Again, as I said, you know there are roles which one can get into in different phases. As I said, if you do not like statistical algorithms, if you do not like machine learning, you can limit yourself here. Learn SQL, learn Tableau, uh, I mean, not even Tableau, Excel, a uh, little bit of databases there, and become a data management expert here. Okay, in the first phase, let's call it as the first phase. Now, if you are a little bit into, you know, you, you're not afraid of statistical algorithm, which I say one should not be in machine learning algorithms, then you can get into a quick, uh, you can easily get into experimentation uh, roles as well. You can be called as a data a junior data scientist or a data analyst or a statistical analyst or a, uh, you know, I mean, different role, business analytics professional, whatever, different banks call it differently or different financial institutions call it differently. And if you know everything, that means the data management part, the experimentation or the machine learning algorithm part, and also the deployment part, then you can actually start working as a pure data scientist or a full stack uh, data scientist, maybe a junior one to start with, right? That means, you know, you need to know a little bit of deployment as well. Does it make sense, guys? So this is the complete workflow. Now, I've got five minutes here, guys. I'm going to open the floor for questions. What questions do you guys have? You understood this, guys? And this is what we cover in our diploma. IV covers in our IV's diploma in data science program. Covers everything right from data extraction, data management, to experimentation, statistical algorithm, machine learning, and to deployment, right? So if you want to become a pure data scientist or full stack data scientist, as we call, then you may want to explore our diploma in data science uh, program. Now, I'm opening the floor for questions. What questions do you guys have? Hi, Jyoti. Yeah. Yeah, this is Gaurav. Uh, I see, I am uh, now having four to five years of experience in sales. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. no background in finance. Uh, so, done my BTEC and then my done, did my MBA. I understood well. your question, Gaurav. Maybe I'll in, yeah. uh, uh, interrupt you in the interest of time. I understood that, you know, if you do not have any background in finance, then how can yeah. you get into uh, uh, in yes. finance? Will I be employable? That is my question. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, what I suggest is, you know, whenever somebody tells me that I've spent some significant years, which is three, four, five years of, or plus years of experience in a particular domain, then I first question comes to my mind is why change the domain? Because data science is applied a lot in sales and marketing analytics industry. And there the companies will need people like you, people who come with pure sales background and understand data science as well. Or if you want to get into financial data, uh, data science specifically, I can think of a few examples from our students community. They went into marketing analytics of like your consumer analytics or sales and marketing analytics within a banking firm or within a financial institution, right? Don't try and explore risk analytics there. Try and work on case studies, uh, projects which are more towards cross-selling, upselling financial products to the consumer. You understand what I'm saying, Gaurav? Yes, yes. Thank you. Don't Got don't it. miss out on the experience that you have gained by having worked in the book in the industry. Which tools are used for deployment? Um, Shreya, so as part of the machine learning algorithm, I'm going to just skip that part. You know, there are a lot of things that you will learn as part of this. Science, Shiny, Flask, uh, Docker, Zo Dozo, uh, Django, and so forth. Those are the tools which help you to deploy the machine algorithm on cloud or on a cloud-based uh, web app or a mobile app. Not very difficult. Siddharth's question is, will machine learning take over DS role in role? I mean, see, the way I define this, and these are all subjective definitions, uh, Siddharth. The way I define data science is that it's an umbrella term which includes almost everything except for the machine except for the deep learning part so if i were to say 
that if I were to create Venn diagrams, then I would say, let's say this is data science, right? And I would say here is, let's say this is AI and this is deep learning, right? And this is machine learning. Machine learning is a sort of statistical tool which will help you do predictive, uh, you know, uh, uh, analytics using supervised and unsupervised algorithm. And let's say this is data visualization, right? So data science is a set of techniques and tools and strategies which help a human being make a decision, right? Whereas artificial intelligence is a set of tools, techniques, uh, computational algorithms which make a machine mimic human decisions, right? So if you look at this as AI, deep learning is part of this, right? So, and machine learning is pretty much part of data science as well, is how I describe it, right? But again, you know, if you ask five data scientists, they will have a different definition of machine learning. So to answer your question, whether machine learning will take over a job of a data scientist, I say that, you know, machine learning is actually pretty much one of the core skills that a data scientist should have. Chandra Khan's question is, he's in third year IT engineer student. How can you listen? I mean, start working on the project. See, I mean, I've got a strategy as well here. What is the uh, strategy? Of course, you know, I'm from IV, so I, I would talk about IV's diploma and data science course. Uh, you know, there are a lot of free courses we have given on YouTube, our, our YouTube platform as well. The link is given, uh, or you can just Google IV Pro School YouTube. You know, start learning and start doing. This is very important that you start doing. You know, this is one of the very, very important things that you should do is start doing it project basis right i mean as part of ib's courses as well you work on 30 plus projects and case studies right so and we give internship opportunities uh, again to kind of make people confident in what they have learned uh, in applying those what whatever they have learned and when we give them projects and these are not just dummy projects these are projects you know projects by uber hsbc accenture uh, music now there are so many different companies real life data science swiggy ola oyo there are so many projects that they work on. Uh, so, you know, when you work on these projects, when you have a project-based learning focus, then, you know, you have something to substantiate, to uh, provide a, uh, uh, you know, evidence that you've learned and applied. People, companies want to see what your application level knowledge is, not just what you have learned, right? And one very important thing is that learn deployment skills, how to deploy. They're not actually difficult at all. A lot of people get scared of this because this sounds technology oriented, but it's not really difficult. If you learn this, right? And also if you're specifically interested in finance, just start reading Financial Times, any Economics Times or a Business Standard or Mint. Start reading from today every day for at least 45 minutes. Start learning those terminologies which you find difficult to understand. They're not difficult. That's how I have learned most of the things that I know in finance. I'm a computer engineer uh, who did a MS in operations management and uh, information system, but, and I've worked in strategy, but most of my clients were financial clients, right? So that's how I've learned, right? Salary deeper, do not worry. You know, I mean, the average financial data scientist salary is upwards of 15 lakhs, average. So people do not worry about money in the world of data science, specifically, especially in financial data science world. Um, Yes, there are uh, maybe, uh, so Shreya, you can uh, probably ping me later. I can explain you what may be not there in that particular course module. I think the AI part is not there in that particular course module. The rest of the things are all, all there. One other question that was there since we have a little bit of time, uh, how does blockchain impact the data science industry? So blockchain is also helping us. So what is blockchain, right? Blockchain is that, for example, before the uh, blockchain became prevalent, or I mean, still is not very, very prevalent. See, uh, let's say person A is giving money to person B, right? There are two different people. They are, one is giving money to person B. Now, if it is not a cash transaction, right? So they would go through a bank. So they would go through a bank. The bank would say, you know what? I am, uh, A is my customer. And my customer gave an instruction to give money. It's not a directly transfer money to a, a customer B. So the bank keeps a transaction record, which can be held in the court of law saying that, hey, if person B claims that, hey, I did not receive any money from person A. So person A can say that, you know what, let me show you my bank statement. 
and he will get an affidavit also from the bank saying that hey yes the person a transferred this amount to this particular account uh, in which is on person b's name right so it's a record keeper right similarly in blockchain what happens is instead of one centralized bank which is keeping the record of the transaction there are multiple people in the chain so let's say if person a is here and person b is here person a transfers money to person b this transaction is not just recorded in their books of accounts but is recorded in everybody who's part of that blockchain let's say these are all different people uh, who are there who are part of this chain of transactions so they all get a uh, entry of a sort that hey person a has transferred to person b so there is no centralized record keeper but the entire chain is keeping that record so that is why it becomes a distributed or decentralized record keeping so now what is happening with this is that earlier the data was limited to a central bank i mean like to a bank right but here the data is now getting distributed to so many different people does it make sense sir so uh, one of the very important ways that the blockchain might affect the banks is that a lot of people may start using blockchain bypassing the central bank infrastructure to do transactions right but what is the latest thing that you would notice is that lot of com- lot of banking financial institutions are launching their own blockchain network that means they are saying that all right do not just rely on us but this blockchain is connected to let's say icis is launching a blockchain network which is connected to hdfc's network which is connected to city banks network which is connected to standard charters network so every bank is interconnected through that chain of uh, through that blockchain do you understand what i'm trying to say so yes it kind of threatens what bank is doing but banks are also becoming smarter right so again the idea is that it generates even more data so rahul's question is will iv assess for getting jobs uh, well i mean rahul that's one of the things that you know we of course do i mean uh, you can go to our linkedin page and you can see some of the recent job posting you can go to our website download some career career transition handbook which is right there on the desktop i mean on the uh, home page so you will see uh, the stories i mean see the success stories people who transform from where to where um, but remember rahul you know it's again as i said right data science is an industry where there are so many openings you just if you if you go to linkedin right i mean i always say that just go to linkedin you will find if i just go to linkedin i'm not even going to indeed i'm not even going to nokri monster or anything i'm just going to go to linkedin here i look for data science jobs right and i i do a search right now of course there are jobs here but i will not even go to jobs i will go to post post are some the post are something that people have given the post right so look at 650 almost 650 job post are there which are regarding the uh, openings in the world of data science so what i'm trying to say is that if there are uh, so many people who are hiring right in the world of data science and you know i will let's say if you uh, again you can filter it by date posted you can filter by location and then if you if i don't uh, do a Uh, this thing right if i do all and if i simply do uh, jobs here so you'll see approximately 20000 last time check okay 17000 last time i checked it was around 19000 a uh, couple of weeks back right and so you'll see a lot of openings right which are there in the world of data science so don't worry about in terms of whether there are opportunities or not but these opportunities are there for people who are relevantly skilled and can substantiate their skills so become social with your skills if you go to some of our uh, students profiles right i mean let's say i am going to go to uh, one of my uh, recently passed one of our recently passed students uh, if you look at her profile right i mean i'm just uh, so she was actually a bcom you know again a finance uh, student commerce student in fact she got a very good job in this company nino opel which is headed by some of the iitians very good not exactly a startup startup now but very good pay master and very good kind of work that they do they famously hire only people from uh, tier 1 college but and tier 1 tech colleges normally but you know they have hired her as well but look at her profile right her featured job featured uh, profile is full filled with the project that she's done as part of right and there are so many people who have liked this project 232 people liked it uh, you will find you know 111 people liked it all these projects 291 people liked her pro- uh, profile so if you notice right i mean what i'm uh, what i'm trying to tell you is that Uh, look at this 2020 grad she graduated right in the middle of pandemic right and she got by the end of it she got more than a few offers right so 
what makes sense here is that work just not certification just not the course but work on the projects and that's what we try and do in our uh, two things that we keep focusing on you know we kind of follow what steve jobs said that build a great product and then build a great marketing strategy around that product so we build a lot of marketable skills in our students by virtue of making them work on various different projects right and then we help them build social profile a solid social resume right so that they can actually market if i showed her uh, if i showed you guys her uh, profile you will actually see what i'm talking about i know i've taken a few extra time but look at her profile of course her name is redacted so look at her resume her resume if you notice in all our projects oriented the first page now remember she's a commerce student fresh college grad commerce students but projects in data science data visualization storytelling all projects and for every project she has given a public link and if i go to the public link actually i'll go to the um, i'll go to these projects over here and as a recruiter if i open maybe i'll not open all of the projects because her resume is filled with such projects and her social links remember she's just a you know a bcom grad but filled with projects right and list are given so as a recruiter i may just open one or two such projects and see what she has done and if i see that 200 plus people 100 plus people have liked it commented then you know what other proof do i need to get on her skill set right so that's how we now make our students create a social uh, resume not just don't and every project right i mean um, for every project uh, i'm going to show you one of the projects actually for every project what she has done is i mean what we make our students do now is nowadays is that we make them work on and we make them create videos a small video of less than 3 to 4 minutes every project right and we host the good projects as well on our uh, youtube platform when you create a project a video like this that means you're also showcasing your pro- presentation skills see earlier we used to make our uh, students do presentation skills only only in the classroom but now we have made them public we made them social right so in fact uh, if you go to our uh, youtube platform uh, there is a specific playlist where we have hosted some of our good students i mean good projects by our students so it's industry projects by students so you can actually see some of the projects you will of course find projects where people have done projects from multiple domains i mean data visualization data reporting to dashboarding to machine learning to statistical algorithm to sql various different things but yeah so the need of the hour is to be able to create a profile as strong as this where you are confident enough to project to let the entire world know what you know and have peer reviews done it's like when you go to buy a, a something on amazon the first thing that you see is that student i mean the customer reviews similarly here when you your projects become social and people are commenting on it liking those projects right so you you know as a recruiter when i see some pro- uh, resumes like that and when i open any such social project i mean project which is socially available and people have commented and they've said that they really really like 100 people have said they really like it then there is no other uh, uh, substantiation that i need right guys all right guys thanks a lot for attending today's workshop it was great having you here guys i am going to give you my email id uh, feel free to get connected with me also i am going to give you my um, you know uh, linkedin profile so if you just google pratik agarwal iv i'll be you'll find me as the first link uh, feel free to get connected send me a uh, invest uh, send me a invite i'll be more than happy these are the two platform linkedin as well uh, twitter as well i remain active so these are the only two platform social platform that i uh uh how do you apply for this diploma in data science program uh just uh, um i mean you can apply from our website you can go to our website rahul uh, rutwi but you can also just send an email to info@ivproschool.com i mean everything is there on our website as well but you know you can just send a uh, email as well and you know we will respond there you know you can just uh, reach out to me as well and i'll be more than happy to help you Let me see if I can find that link quickly for you. Yeah, already, guys. Great having you guys here today. Yeah, I'll be uh, more than happy to answer any of your questions that you have. I'll be here for the next two three minutes. But uh, thanks a lot for joining in today, guys. And I hope to see you guys again. 
uh, whenever I see you next. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Don't forget to get connected with me on LinkedIn and maybe on Twitter. Uh, I'll be more than happy to get connected with you all. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thanks.